All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Rick Hassan. I'm co-director of the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center at UCI School of Law. Thanks so much for joining us for this event. What can and should journalists do to prevent election subversion and another January 6th? I'd like to thank Colleen Terkani, Rabi Kadri, Aaron Hebert, and Anna Eilif for their help in putting this event together and, and all of the events that we run at the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center. And I would like to tell you at the outset, so I don't forget, uh, that our next event is going to be great on February 2nd at 5 p.m. Pacific time. David Kay, the co-director of the center with me, is going to be in conversation with Nobel Prize laureate Maria Ressa about press freedoms and social media in an international comparative perspective. That's a program you really won't uh, want to miss. I also want to tell you that um, I will be um, looking at questions that you submit that you can submit in the Q using the Q&A function. The chat function is not available uh, for uh, viewers. But if you do have a question for the panelists, please use the Q&A function. And I hope to reserve the last part of our conversation for uh, Q&A. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome an all-star panel to speak on the issues of journalism and the risks to democracy in the United States. I'll be uh, briefly introducing the speakers. You can find links to their full bios on the event webpage on the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center website, law.uci.edu slash FEFS. Um, each of uh, the participants today has written an article that is relevant to this topic of the symposium. And after I uh, introduce the speakers, I'll be putting links to those articles in the chat so that you can uh, click on those. Barton Gelman is a staff writer at The Atlantic and the author most recently of the book Dark Mirror, Edward Snowden and the American Surveillance State, and the best-selling Angler, The Cheney Vice Presidency, he has held positions as, as a senior fellow at the Century Foundation, lecturer at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School, and is visiting research collaborator at Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. He's the author of the current cover story in The Atlantic, Trump's Next Coup Has Already Begun. And I'll be putting the link to that in the chat. Jessica Huseman is editorial director of VoteBeat. She was previously the lead elections reporter for ProPublica and help manage the election land project for three federal election cycles, sharing information and tips with hundreds of newsrooms across the United States. She is the owner of Friendly State News, which offers low and no cost training to local newsrooms. She recently wrote the article for VoteBeat, Nothing Has Changed to Prevent Another January 6th. I'll be putting that in the chat. And Margaret Sullivan is the Washington Post media columnist and author of Ghosting the News, Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy. Uh, she was the chief editor of the Buffalo News and served as the longest uh, serving public editor at the New York Times. Her recent Washington Post column relevant to this uh, discussion is called, If American Democracy is Going to Survive, the Media Must Make This Crucial Shift. And I'll have the link to that in the chat as well. And so the way I'm going to proceed is I have a question for each panelist separately, and then I have some questions for all of the panelists together. Uh, and then uh, I hope to open it up to your questions. Uh, so let me start with Bart. Um, welcome. Uh, you've been uh, now, you've now had a second cover story within I think about 18 months uh, on the topic of election subversion. And I wanna ask you, what are the challenges of doing reporting for this article? And how did you approach communicating the risks to American democracy through this kind of forum? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your uh, what the reporting was like and what the writing process uh, was like uh, as well. Okay, thanks for having me. Uh, the first story uh, came out in September before the election, and it started with the premise, uh, which was not uh, especially hard to forecast, that under no circumstances would Donald Trump concede defeat in the election uh, if Biden got more votes. Uh, that Trump simply wouldn't do it, and that that was highly consequential. Uh, that the concession speech is actually, in practice, far more important uh, to the American constitutional system, even though it's nowhere specified um, as necessary, because we don't have one referee, as you well know, uh, of who wins and who loses an election. 
And I uh, talked to experts like you uh, to find out uh, what subversion techniques would be available to a candidate who refused to concede. Uh, and I talked to state and local party officials and lawyers, uh, including uh, one for the Trump campaign, uh, who talked to me about how they already were considering the possibility of asking state legislatures to uh, override the will of the voters and to simply appoint Trump electors in states that Biden won. Uh, the second piece, which is the current cover, uh, talks about how Trump is actually in a better position now, uh, paradoxically, that he's not the president to subvert the next election. Uh, because although he tried to use the powers of the presidency uh, to steal the last election, uh, he did not try effectively. And uh, government institutions did a pretty good job of warding him off. Uh, the Pentagon was not going to let him declare martial law. And uh, Bill Barr turned aside his efforts uh, to uh, subordinate the Justice Department. And then notwithstanding the efforts of Jeffrey Clark, uh, Barr's successors uh, by threatening resignation uh, managed to ward off additional efforts. And so what Trump's uh, real methods are have to do with going after all the obstacles uh, that prevented him from stealing the election last time and systematically going around and uprooting them. And so my job as a reporter was to uh, was to take a tour of those obstacles and see what's become of them uh, and what the Trump folks are doing about it. Uh, these are really big, broad subjects that need granular detail to make them real. And so you have uh, the problem. A, a photographer once told me that there are certain shots that you just need a wide angle telephoto lens and there is no such thing. Uh, and this reminded me of that. It, it, I, I needed a lot of granular detail, but I was trying to tell a very high concept story at the same time. Uh, and so Jessica, um, I think uh, Bart's, the end of Bart's answer flows right into what I wanted to ask you. So much of the risk of election subversion happens down at the state and local level. Uh, for example, we saw Trump trying to get state legislatures to send in alternative slates of electors VoteBeat is trying to cover this issue on the state and local level. What challenges do you think are faced by VoteBeat and others in trying to do this coverage? And how do you and others connect up the local story to the, the national conversation that we need to have about the security of American elections? That's a really good question. So I, I think that there is a real misunderstanding on the part of voters and also frankly, lawmakers about how influential the federal government actually is when it comes to voting procedures. Um, it, it happens far more on the state and local level, which is why VoteBeat is sort of a, no, a, a nationally linked but local network um, of journalists. Um, and, and I think that one of the challenges that we face, honestly, is, is that elections have not become a media darling coverage topic except for in the last couple of years. And that has trickled down irregularly in the local in local areas, which means that when I call county clerks, it often takes me a while to just get them on the phone because they are not used to talking to the media. They are not comfortable talking to the media. And as soon as I call them, they freak out and assume that I'm going to write something terrible about them, which is often not the case at all. Um, but it's it's often difficult just to kind of get them to, to be as transparent as we'd like them to be. And I think that there has been a real misunderstanding in the last couple of years versus, you know, lack of understanding of how to deal with the media versus willful lack of transparency. And I think often it is the prior and not the latter. And it takes a real, um, it takes a level of patience and a, and, a, and a willingness to kind of educate your sources and how to talk to you while you're talking to them uh, than, than, you know, offices that have a press officer have at the federal and state level. If you're talking to a municipal officer, the likelihood that they've got someone handling their media calls is very small. And so it, it takes a little bit more patience than, than I think that most political reporters are willing to give. 
Thanks for that. And uh, that leads me to my question for Margaret to open this up. Um, uh, Margaret, one of the risks of a covering election subversion is that it's too hard a story to grasp. The risk is inchoate. If it happens, it's going to happen two years down the line or four years down the line or eight years down the line. In contrast, when it comes to voter suppression, everyone understands depriving voters of a glass of water while they're waiting online to vote. What do you think are the best, what do you think is the best way to tell this story? And what do you think the best practices are that journalists should follow in covering this issue? So, you know, it, it, it reminds me a little bit, well, thank, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for doing this um, really important panel. And, um, you know, I, I have such respect for everyone on it. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, so thank you. Um, it, it reminds me a little bit of, of covering climate change um, because it's, it's just a hard story to tell in some ways. It's a huge, it's very big, as Bart said, it's very, it's, it's very large and um, it's happening in this kind of, um, in a way that's hard to grasp and tell in, an, in, a, in, traditional, in a traditional, you know, um, media format like that's pegged to uh, breaking news stories. And that of course is not the only kind of thing the press does. But um, you know, you have to sort of find a way to tell it, and and that's that's part of why. I mean, I hope I'm not jumping the gun here, but it, it's part of why I think that it can be helpful to have, um, you know, sort of teams of people working on this subject, um, and and to present it to the public in kind of a a defined way, like we are actually covering. The democracy beat here, and we're going to call it that, and we're going to define it that way, so that it's not just the sort of incremental stuff that might not seem graspable in the moment, but in a but is is more um, it, it is more kind of labeled as something that people can get their heads around. Great. Well, I I don't know how many. Um journalistic outfits are following that practice. You highlighted uh, a little bit in, in your column about that, but um, there has been an increased call for this. And, and so I wanna ask a little bit, and this is maybe, the, you know, this is the big question that I have for all of you. And it's a question that I think reporters and academics face similarly. Uh, just putting this panel together, uh, I was accused of bias uh, to bring together journalists and not present the other side. I'm not sure what the other side of election subversion risk is, um, but the question is this, uh, how can reporters fairly report on election subversion without the risk of being seen as taking sides for or against Donald Trump in the world we live in now? Should journalists remain neutral on the issue of democracy? If not, where's the line? And I, I wanna hear from each of you. Um, maybe I'll start with Jessica uh, on this round. Um, where do you, how do you think the norms, you're, you're a journalism teacher, right? So uh, how do you think the norms of journalism fit into this very unusual moment uh, that we have and norm, normal norms of journalistic objectivity? You know, I, I, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I'm gonna try to boil them down to something coherent so I don't sound like a lunatic. But I, I think first I would say that journalists have a very specific role to play in American democracy. Like our rights as an institution are enshrined in the constitution. Voting isn't even enshrined in the constitution, right? We have our rights as members of the press because there is a underlying understanding that we will be telling people what they need to know about the government so that they can cast ballots that are well substantiated and, and they become well-educated voters. And so to the extent that our power only exists so that we can inform the public, it makes complete sense to me that we should encourage people to participate in the franchise. Certainly we shouldn't tell them how to vote, but it should be well within our authority to encourage people to vote and also to make sure that voting is as easy and secure as it can be, because that is the entire basis for our role in this country as outlined in the constitution. And so so 
you know, I think that 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 it is fine for journalists to do things like print voter registration forms or give people information about how effectively to cast a ballot or where to find good information on candidates or what IDs they can use at the polls and even help people do checklists for preparing to vote. I think all of that is fully within our grasp. I also think, though, that journalists tend to listen to advocates far more than they should, right? The likelihood that advocates actually understand how the election administration system works is very small, right? They may have a very specific argument around rights, but if what they want to do cannot be carried out by the technology at our, at our disposal or the or the people that we have at our disposal or the laws that undergird the system, then you know, writing articles criticizing the system for something that literally can't do is just not a very nuanced perspective. And I see that happening all the time. And, and so I, I, I think that really the answer is one, journalists should be very full-throated about the right to vote and the ability for people to exercise it and how, but also if we're going to do that, we have it, it is incumbent upon us to fully understand how the system works works from the cybersecurity that protects it to the laws that organize it. And we need to be able to be our own experts in these things because it is such a crucial part of, of our interaction with the public. Margaret, you've been the public editor looking over the shoulder of New York Times journalists, which uh, is one that seems like a really tough position to be in. So you know, how do you assess this question about um, objectivity and fairness in, in, in when there are these risks to uh, the uh, integrity of the American election system. Yes, I was the public editor for the for the longest time uh, of anyone and I, I'm still here to tell the tale. So that alone, you know, it's a career try, it's a career high point. Um, I, I think there are some things that that really don't have both sides. And this is one of them. I mean, there, there. I, I don't know what the other side of this is. You know, there's a there's a false other side, which is you're not listening to the right, and you're sounding like you're um, you're mouthing DNC talking points. You know, I hear that from people. To some extent, I think we we need to get over feeling defensive about straightforwardly telling the truth and standing up for. Um, Basic things like voting security and, um, and you know all the things we're talking about. There, there is no other side. There is no legitimate other side to it. So you know, I, I've never been someone who's who would say, "Oh, you should ignore what readers. You should ignore what the public is saying." I don't. I don't. I don't want to think that way. But to some extent, this is a case in which. Uh, we have to do what's clearly right and not get into a defensive crouch about it or start to overcompensate by um, including false or um, ill-informed or false or actually seditious points of view. You're muted. It, you know, it wouldn't be a Zoom event if uh, someone wasn't uh, speaking on mute. And usually it shouldn't be the moderator, but there it goes. Um, um, thank you for that. Uh, Bart, I want to turn to you. And I imagine that your inbox was flooded with uh, angry messages um, after your, uh, probably after both of the pieces, but after the most recent piece, um, where people are impugning your uh, objectivity. Uh, what is your reaction as a journalist and, and how do you, uh, uh, make your way through the day with all of that. I'm doing that objectivity with the least of it. Uh, but uh, leaving aside some of the um, over the top uh, kinds of uh, angry uh, or threatening communications that uh, you get these days when writing about our polarized world. Uh, I would just say the way I think about it is that I'm very uncomfortable with the position I'm in writing about democracy and threats to democracy uh, because uh, I grew up in the mainstream media understanding that my job was not to take the side of, uh, of one uh, party or the other or party to a conflict or political party, uh, that I was to give each side its best and 
uh, it's, it's best to say red in the light most favorable to that party to make sure everybody gets their say in. Uh, and the problem right now with the democracy beat is that we have in this country only one party that is willing to lose an election. We have only one party that's willing to tell the truth about the last election. Uh, and it is as stark as that. And so writing a fair and honest story about uh, threats to democracy uh, looks a lot like a story uh, that favors the Democratic Party as opposed to small d Democrats. And I've made my peace with that because there are certain things that reporters are allowed to stand for. I mean, let's take the most basic obvious one. We're allowed to, we're allowed to think that truth is better than, than lies. Uh, and so it's a story if someone tells someone consequential tells a consequential lie, that's news because the premise is lying is bad. Uh, we're allowed to think that killing non-combatants uh, is to be frowned upon, and so it's a story when that happens. Uh, likewise, we're we're allowed to defend the constitutional structure that gives us our own mandate. Uh, the the reason why. The First Amendment is structurally where it is in the Bill of Rights, uh, arguably, is uh, that it's an essential part of the social culture of a democracy to have information flowing. And so we're allowed to be pro-democracy. And so it seems to me that while there are legitimate stories that say uh, that uh, Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema have thwarted uh, Biden and Biden has lost in the scorekeeping sense, um, or that the failure to pass the voting rights legislation was a blow to the Democratic Party. Both of those things are true and can be written about, but there needs to be a fundamental story that says that it was a blow to democracy. Uh, and that explains in concrete terms what it is uh, that, that got lost. Uh, with those votes and how it is that there is a, an ongoing meaningful threat of election subversion and of election suppression, voter suppression, uh, and that tools for addressing those have been blocked by the party doing the suppressing and the subversion. Uh, and that's a, that's a fair frame uh, for, the, for the true story here. I want to follow up on that and, and ask uh, if any of you want to comment on just on a personal level, how you think journalists should deal with threats, because we do know that it's not just election officials uh, who've been threatened. There have been cases, including some recent cases that pu were publicized in relation to 2020, where journalists have been threatened for how they're covering elections and politics. And how, uh, this is open to any of you, uh, how, how should these how should journalists handle these personal uh, risks that, that arise? Can you just put it into a corner and, 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 and not deal with it, Margaret? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of people say threatening things to me, um, you know, not, not so much in person, but certainly in email and voicemail and uh, on social media. And it, it is very upsetting. It's it's um, it's daunting. Um, it it can also be um, something that makes you think twice about um, doing what you should do. So it, it's effective in many ways. Um, I mean, you have to take steps to protect yourself. And I have reported many an uh, such an encounter to the security team at the Washington Post, and they you know, track it back and see if this is someone who's just spouting off or actually someone who, uh, you know, is a threat. Um, so you have to take care of yourself. You have to alert the people who can help you take care of yourself. Um, and you have to, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that this is some sort of rare form of courage, but you have to kind of go on with it. I mean, you cannot be cowed by it. Um, it, that is the actual purpose of it. It's the purpose of this kind of abusive behavior to get you to stop and to shut up. And the minute you do that, you, you know, you, you've, you've let those forces win. So I think you have to carry on safely and with, um, 
with a sense of the psychological toll it takes, which is can be substantial. And I, you know, I just add to that and say that, you know, if you, especially if you're at a smaller news organization, uh, you know, like Bootbeat doesn't have a security team. Um, but so I, I'm having to do a lot of this myself. And thankfully, when I was at Republica, I got some really wonderful training on kind of like protecting myself on the internet. Um, so I've taken steps to remove myself from public databases. Um, when I moved to Texas, I actually attempted to um, remove myself from the voter roll, but I can't do that uh, because I am not a victim of domestic violence with a documented police history of domestic violence, even if I have a documented police history of threats against me. Um, so I actually get quite a few letters to my home and I can only imagine that that's why. Um, so, you know, I, I, I agree with everything that that Margaret said. I mean, you just have to kind of like go on with it. Um, but I think that there are proactive steps that you can you can take. And then also I would encourage you to report the threats out. Uh, like, you know, so many of these people are not only threatening journalists, but are threatening election administrators as well. And so if you can identify someone, like the story doesn't necessarily have to be about you. It can be about the larger problem. But, um, you know, journalists who report on election issues who get threats in this way are, are just case studies a larger problem. Uh, Bart, I don't know if you want to weigh in on this. Otherwise, I, I, I just a word or two. I mean, I, I, I'm not uh, either an expert on this or someone who's experienced in a, an extraordinary amount of this kind of static. Uh, I think that the universe of abusers overlaps pretty uh, substantially with the with with the universe of misogyny and uh, uh, of of uh, racial bigotry. And so as a white male, I'm privileged uh, to get a smaller share of abuse online. But if, if you're concerned about this and you're a reporter from a small organization that doesn't have a dedicated security team, uh, go to the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, the uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, uh, and places like that, and, and take advantage of the free resources they've got for how to report securely, both uh, uh, digitally and, and uh, in the real world. Well, I wanna remind everyone, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. There are already a lot of questions in there. I'll turn to them in a few minutes. Uh, I won't be able to get to all of them, but I'll try and get to a, a representative sample of those questions. Um, I wanna to turn to the question of expertise. So Bart, you and I, I don't, can't remember how many phone calls and emails we exchanged about the independent state legislature doctrine. Uh, which is something that was not on my radar until a couple of years ago, but is now something that I'm regularly called about. Um, understanding the risk to American democracy, I think requires looking at other countries that have moved from democracy, from democracy to authoritarianism. And I, so this is a question first with Bart asking about the issue of expertise. You, know, you had suggested that you were kind of well situated to report. Do you think the average reporter knows enough to be able to report on this issue? How do you get up to speed on issues like this that are, that are you know, kind of like, as Margaret said, like climate change, they require a lot of understanding of the underlying uh, of facts, but also an ability to communicate that to a wider audience. None of us start off as experts on anything. Uh, and none of us are experts on everything. Uh, our our whole profession, our, our, our superpower is supposed to be how you find things out, how you get reliable information, how do you figure out um, which experts know what, how you triangulate uh, between competing views of the world, um, how to find uh, uh, trustworthy uh, resources for data uh, and so forth. And that's something that it's like learning library skills when you're a student. Uh, that you you just have to you have to master the mastery of expertise, uh, and so uh, I came to you because uh, you're well known to be uh, uh, preeminent in this field, and I spent a lot of time on the phone with you because it was well, time well spent. Uh, I, I mean, I was you, you were willing to tolerate a lot of dumb questions, and then gradually I was 
able to figure out how to ask smarter questions. Uh, and then I went off and read things and uh, talked to other people. So it's, it's, it's good to have beat reporters who stay on a beat for a while and get to know the ins and outs and get to know the people and get the payoff of having built up a certain amount of expertise. But you're always going to have people who are new to the subject. And we need a lot of people who are new to the subject now because it's a very big subject and it's not getting proportionate attention. Let, let me ask uh, Margaret and then Jessica to respond on this point too. And, and uh, just to put a little bit of a, uh, a finer point on it, um, it's, it's reporting in the eye of the hurricane. And sometimes it's hard to have perspective on where say the United States is uh, in terms of the risk to democracy when we're in the middle of this. Uh, how do you gain that perspective in addition to gaining the expertise? M Margaret first. I mean, I think you, we have to be, we have to be talking to people, you know, we have to be doing the things that journalists do. We have to be talking to people um, both within our exact sphere of what we're reporting on and trying to, to broaden and, and deepen that. And, um, and, you know, to do a lot of reading and to, you know, frankly, to understand history better than a lot of us do, um, I think can be, can be very helpful. Um, so, you know, as Bart says, we're kind of, uh, this is, there's a lot of on the job training with, with journalism. Um, you know, we've all sort of had to source up quickly, ramp up our, our, our ability to, to report on something, you know, maybe while, probably while we're writing a story and maybe because we're writing that story. Um, so that's, you know, it's kind of built in. But um, I do think that expertise is, is important. And, and I guess I would say that, uh, you know, it's always important for journalists to understand, uh, to understand what's happened historically and globally, and maybe uh, particularly so in this situation. Jessica? Yeah, I think that in addition to those things, I would add that, especially when covering issues of democracy and voting, having a really solid and nuanced understanding of America's history on, in these in these areas is incredibly helpful. I mean, I think that a lot of the sky is falling coverage comes from simply not understanding where we are in history and what has happened prior to this and how those prior issues have been solved. And I think if you have a better understanding of the scope of history, not only do you understand sort of the seriousness of any given moment, but you also have a better sort of for lack of a better word, bullshit detector with the experts that you choose to go to, right? If you know that what they're saying is deeply out of alliance with what you understand the history of the issue to be, then you can kind of move on much more quickly. And then I would also say that I try to maintain a solid wheelhouse of people that I go to to consult on everything. And I ensure that they are pretty diverse, like racially, ideologically, um, you know, geographically is hugely important when it comes to elections. So, you know, I see actually some of my little brain trust in the in the chat here. Shout out. Hey. Um, and and I will text them and say, like, what do you think of this? And I get lots of different responses. And the truth is usually somewhere in the middle or maybe Maybe they all agree and there is like really an agreed upon um, fact here. Um, but either way, it's good for me to kind of have these people that I go to all the time that I trust, um, that may have very different points of view, even from me, um, but tend to give me factually accurate information. All right, I'm going to turn to some of the questions. As I said, I'm, I'm sorry I won't be able to get to all of them, but I want to get through at least some of them. Um, and the first question is about both sidesism. Um, and the question is, uh, at a basic level, how can we get the national media, especially in DC, to stop with the incessant both sides coverage? And if it can't be fixed, how do we survive as a democracy if regular voters who don't pay attention to politics are constantly being told that both sides are equally bad when consuming mainstream media? Um, and let me add to that, you know, how does this happen in a, in a moment when um, the respect and trust in journalism is at, I don't know if it's an all time low, but it's quite a low point along with trust in other institutions. Uh, Margaret, you wanna open up on that one? 
You're muted now. Sorry about that. Um, it, that is something I've written a lot about, and I've also been paying uh, a lot of attention to the question about public trust in the news media um, because of a book I'm writing. So, um, so the the question is apt and kind of up my alley. Um, you know, as Bart said, we are schooled um, traditionally in that both sides is not a bad thing. In fact, sometimes it's hard to when we you know we have this kind of disparaging expression, oh, you're both sizing that, you know, to an outsider, that sounds like a very good idea to include various points of view and consider and report against your own biases and, you know, try not to get on a soapbox necessarily. Um, the, the thing is that I think if we can think about fairness and accuracy um, as the North Star, um, rather than, you know, kind of this performative neutrality that, that makes everything equal, I think that gets us a little farther down the road that we want to be fair to, to all parties, but we want to be fair to the audience, the reader, the news consumer, also known as a, a American citizen. And in, in doing that, we have to represent the truth not take it down the middle. So, you know, the very simple and too simple for this crowd explanation, but maybe useful anyway is, you know, if, if you've got a friend who says it's raining and your other friend says it's perfectly clear out, your job is not, you know, to if you're determining this, your job is not to, you know, oh, well, this person says this and this person says that. Part of the job is to walk outside and look at the sky and to establish independently and verifiably what is true. And then, you know, take your sourcing, um, adjust your sourcing accordingly. Before I let Jessica or Bart weigh in on this, let me read another comment slash question that's relevant. Uh, this comment reads, I'm a former LA Times reporter and like Bart, I was taught to present multiple sides as fairly as possible. Unlike Bart, I don't think that goal needs to be abandoned. I favor letting sources and facts make the case about threats to democracy rather than having the reporter do so. Likewise, let sources counter any opposing views. Given the public's low trust in the media, why do panelists think journalists should be telling readers what truth is rather than laying out the facts and letting them decide for themselves? Uh, Bart and then Jessica. That may not be as big a uh, division uh, as the questioner supposes. I, I don't think that uh, it's my job to make a ruling from the bench on truth in all cases. Uh, but there are times when, uh, and, and, and so frequently, there are, uh, there are, there are uh, factual disputes and multiple opinions or multiple uh, points of view. Uh, and sometimes I will simply juxtapose uh, what someone says with a, uh, a, a, an observable fact uh, and not say this person is lying. You know, I, I don't normally think of, of it as my job to say that someone is lying. Uh, but, and, and in, as Margaret said, both sides is a feature, not a bug of our coverage. It is, it is a fundamental obligation. Uh, to cover the full range of, of, of views or of interests or of parties in interest uh, in a story. Uh, but there are times when that's inadequate. Uh, and so you do include both sides. But if, some, if, if, if one side is, is saying black is white, uh, I think we have an obligation to show that and not to leave it ambiguous in the story whether black is black. Jessica? You know, I think that um, the, the, the question comes, 
kind of compact with, with, I think, something that I reject, right? It's why can't we lay out all the facts and let the readers decide the truth for themselves? Deciding what the facts are is inherently subjective, okay? So like journalists' job is to look at the facts on the ground and select the ones to display to the audience based on the qualifications of the person making the claims, the validity of the claims based on evidence. Like we have time and the capacity to do that your average American does not have time or even the willingness to take a look at every fact that you could possibly present and then decide for themselves, not only which one is right and and which one they agree with, but which facts themselves are true. And that is the basic obligation of a journalist. Journalists are not stenographers. And to the extent that like people think that our job is to just list all of the possible iterations of fact, that is just a deep misunderstanding of what journalism is. And I I think that, you know, you can look at the trajectory of American history and the role that the press has played. You know, if, if you don't like the way that I present the facts, there are several other outlets for you to consider, right? And, and so I, I don't think that, you know, the idea that that we would distill things down to what we believe to be the most true is an inherently wrong thing to do. I think that's just the function of journalism. If I could just add one thing. Yes, to, please. Um, it, it is that while I also hear from people, um, you know, just give me the facts. Um, and I understand, I understand that I understand that urge, you know, you don't want to have something shoved down your throat. You don't want to have um, someone else's bias, you know, foisted on you. I, I totally understand that, but I would just make the, uh, make the point, make the observation that every story, every broadcast, every piece of media has framing in it. It has, what's the headline? What is the angle of the story? What is the language? Who are you quoting? Um, there's really no such thing, even in a Wikipedia entry, uh, as uh, just a bland recitation of facts. I mean, it's our job to sort of tell a story, not a fake story, not a made up story, but to take all this information and make it, um, make it into something useful um, that is fair and that is accurate. It's useful to, uh, to, to show the whole process to the reader, to spell it all out. It becomes an interesting part of the story itself. Uh, so in my current cover story, uh, there's a guy who tells me that the violence on January 6th was caused by Antifa working together with special forces that were uh, set in motion uh, both by Nancy Pelosi and also by, by Mitch McConnell. Uh, and he told me that um, it was the special forces that took Nancy Pelosi's laptop and had discovered she was a traitor and it went on and on. I said, how do you know that? And he said, well, this general said it on Rumble. So I went and found the video and the general did say something like that on Rumble. And so then I called the general and I asked the general, how do you know that? He said, well, I said, how do you know there were special forces there? And and he said, well, they had short haircuts. They looked like special forces. Uh, How do you know Antifa? Well, you know, somebody said they overheard someone saying Antifa. Uh, How do you know that they took a laptop? Well, there was something square under one of their coats. So, I mean, he didn't even purport to have evidence of any of it. And I brought that back to the original person who said it to me, said, does this dissuade you at all? I mean, and that became part of the narrative uh, that I was, that I, yes, I included both sides. I included the guy who told me that it was Antifa, uh, but I showed the reader the whole journey on how I knew that it was un- untrue. You're saying you haven't disproven that it was Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi. Oh, we've got that. Uh, <laughs> um, let me ask the flip side of um, this question about uh, media coverage in both sides. Is, and this is a question from another uh, viewer. Uh, how do we cover this issue without creating reader fatigue? There's a good chance we could be sounding the alarm on election subversion for four years or more with nothing happening and be accused of crying wolf. Uh, and 
I think Bart and I exp both experienced a lot of that in, in 2020. And you know, some people say, well, there was nothing to worry about because the Republic still stands. So how do you sound the alarm without being alarmist? Um, Jessica, let's start with you. You know, I think that the best way to do this is to tell a very specific localized story, right? I, I think that there is a bit of um, fatigue from the national audience of, you know, constant threats of like democracy as an idea falling into the abyss. But I do think that we can boil those bigger concepts down and tell stories about the election system itself that really impact voters and their experience with the voting system. And so if you if we can make real the the real degradation in the voter experience over the last few years and our treatment of democracy by talking about the polling, the closure of polling places and the increase in wait times or talking about the rollback in your ability to cast an absentee ballot or talking about the completely out of date voter technology that constantly breaks on election night and offer real examples that are quite stark um, to hold up to the reader to say this isn't just an idea like we're not just running around talking about the decline of American democracy because we all really like American history. We're talking about it because the voting experience that voters have is substantially worse than it used to be and showing evidence of that is a really good way to get people on board with the idea that we're not just lamenting the death of an idea. We are, in fact, watching the destruction of elements of American democracy that allow people to cast ballots. Margaret, I know that you wanted to wait. Yeah, well, that was that was that is uh, so true, uh, what Jessica says. And, and I have found it, you know, even in column writing that sometimes the best way to tell the big story is by telling it small, narrow. Um, you know, one news organization is doing this and that's why this is important. Here's one person. Um, and, and then it represents the broader thing. But my other point is that what seems, what might seem like overkill to us and to maybe people who are listening and viewing today um, is one thing, but I, I, you know, most people are not consuming news the way we do. And it may not be, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly where I saw this, but, you know, a group, of, a focus group uh, was asked about, you know, how, how alarming do you think January 6th was? And some of them kind of had trouble, you know, knowing what, what are we talking about January 6th? You know, after all what you would, anyone could consider overkill coverage or might, might consider overkill coverage, the, the, the sort of the, regular person who's living their life isn't as immersed. And so um, I'm not sure that, <laughs> I'm not sure we can't, we can say it too much. It's really important. And, you know, we don't want to say it the same way all the time or in a cliched way, or as Jessica says, in a sky is falling way. But um, I think actually what I've called for is centering the coverage and, um, yeah, I think we need to hammer away at it, absolutely. Um, I think that focus group was, uh, that was in the New York Times Sunday Review right after J the January 6th and their coverage of that. Of oh, that place, all right. Bart, I don't know if you had anything to add on this point. Well, I'll let you move on. All right, so um, uh, someone asked the question about the difference between uh, print or web media and, and, and broadcast TV, uh, radio. And I, so I want to just expand that question a little bit and ask, um, is there a, is there a uh, conflict of interest problem, at least at the level of corporate executives, where um, since Trump is out of office, subscriptions are down, uh, viewer, viewership is down, like, you know, the best thing for um, the bottom line of media companies might be for Trump to announce that he's going to run in 2024 and to put his rallies back on TV. And so um, I guess, so it's two questions. One is, is there a conflict of interest problem in terms of covering this at the, at the, uh, at the level of um, those who own uh, journalistic outfits? And second, uh, is, is video uh, and TV radio somehow different in terms of how this stuff is and should be covered? Um, Bart, let me start with you. My hope of you. 
Oh, there you go. I think you were just cutting out for a second. Uh, my, my whole career, people have have uh, criticized me by saying, uh, all you want to do is sell papers. You write sensationalist stories. And it's a fact that subscriptions to The Atlantic, my magazine, um, are down since Trump left office. Uh, he is good for ratings. He's good for subscriptions. He's good for sales. Uh, when he attacked The Atlantic as a fake news magazine, well, that was good for subscriptions. Uh, and so if you believe that, uh, that news organizations are operating according to their uh, financial interests in deciding how to cover events, then we should be absolutely biased in favor of Trump. We should want all Trump all the time. We should want him running. We should want him to be president. Uh, because uh, it, it's good for audience building. Uh, since we are seldom accused of being fronts of uh, pro-Trump uh, 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 opinion, uh, maybe the idea that economic interests are running newsrooms um, isn't always true. But I'm talking about the news organizations that I know. I, I, the Washington Post for many years, um, the Atlantic, uh, I can't speak for all of them. And I, I, I don't really know what it's like in the television industry. Uh, Jessica or Margaret? Uh, I'll jump in for a second. You know, as, as you were asking the question, I was thinking of the famous line from CBS's Les Moonves, who, you know, sort of famously said, um, well, Trump may not be good for America, but he sure is good for CBS. Um, although what he was talking about was, was political advertising. It's sometimes mis misread. But, um, you know, at the best and, and at good news organizations, corporate executives, whatever their thoughts might be about subscriptions and bottom line, do not dictate coverage. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos does not tell us how to cover um, how to cover Amazon, for example, or politics. Um, and so, you know, there is a built-in there there is a built-in sort of editorial in the wall of the editorial independence. And at good news organizations, it works. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I would also say that if if our if our democracy actually is threatened in the way that it may be, that ultimately will not be so good for news organizations. Um, so if if that's really happening and people are taking a wider view or a broader view, they they may not actually want those things. Um, so I don't know. I, I I don't you know I like Bart. I've I've often been told you know you're just trying to sell newspapers. I, I don't know. I never was really trying to sell newspapers. I was trying to write a good story or edit a good story that I thought would interest people, but uh, I don't know. That never really rang true for me. We're almost out of time. So let me um, throw the last question uh, first at Jessica. Um, and it's a big one. Uh, what, if anything, could journalists have done differently uh, from 2017 to, 2000, uh, to 2020 that could have prevented January 6th? Um, and this reader is suggesting that some of the anger at the media was what was responsible for getting people so riled up that they, uh, um, that we did see this insurrection uh, at the Capitol. You know, that, way, that may well be true. I, I you know, I, I think that a lot of that anger was probably unearned and caused by a president who uniquely um, was willing to vilify the media in ways we've not seen in modern American history. But I also think that, you know, I think a more direct answer to your question is that I wish that journalists would do a better job explaining to people how the system of counting votes and casting ballots works. I think a lot of the confusion around January 6th is that the population that stormed the Capitol did not understand how the electoral college votes were cast and counted or what the certification process looked like in each of these states. And if there was a better civic understanding of the mechanics at play in elections, 
and we were all working with more of a full deck in terms of the truth, um, then a lot of the conspiracy theories and misinformation that took off so quickly um, and led to a lot of the violence that day simply wouldn't have gotten off the ground. I mean, we should have as good of understanding of, of this process and the mechanics of it as we do the public school system, but there is far more engagement there than on voting mechanics and voting machines. And, and the reason that people believe that voting machines are double counting votes or flipping votes is because they fundamentally don't understand how election security and election technology works. And if it's not the press's job to educate people on that, I'm really not sure whose job it is. It's, it's really incumbent upon us to not only talk about the candidates, but also talk about the system. Well, I think we're gonna have to leave it there. I wanna thank Bart Gelman, uh, Jessica Kusman, Margaret Sullivan, very sobering discussion, very meaty discussion, which I hope will uh, help journalists and others out there as we move forward in trying to preserve and protect American democracy. Again, let me remind you that on February 2nd at 5 p.m. Pacific time, David Kay, the co-director of the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center, will be in conversation with Nobel Prize laureate Maria Ressa. And we have some more events that we'll be announcing soon at the Fair Election and Free Speech Center. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, stay safe and have a, have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>